Joining me today is a sociologist, a physician, a professor at Yale University, and author of the new book, Blueprint, The Evolutionary Origins of a Good Society, Nick Christakis. Welcome to The Rubin Report. Thank you for having me, Dave. I am happy to have you here, sir, but I'm depressed that I have to start the show the way I sort of have to start the show, and yeah. I suspect you know how I have to start the show. Yeah. So, do you want to set it up for me? Well, I mean, we, I, we do just have to get this out of the way. I know, is, I know. I mean, I knew is. when the book was published. I mean, I've been working on the book for nine years, and I knew when it was published that I would have to revisit uh, those events from 2015, which, you know, were just a challenging period of my life. Um, thankfully, in the past, I'm really glad to have it behind me. Yeah. But I recognize that. So you tell whatever part of it you want to tell. Okay. So you. Uh, are and were a professor at Yale. Yes. And this is this is in I think the fall of 2015. Yes. It's fall of 2015, and your wife Erica, who's also a professor, uh, childhood development. She was an instructor, but yes. Yeah. So. Uh, she basically wrote a piece that said it was a defense of free speech, and and it was sort of worked around the Halloween costume idea that you know you should wear what you want, but you can try to be respectful of people, but you know we shouldn't have some sort of top down version where people, you know, administrators or professors are telling students what to wear. You offered her a bit of a defense on that. And now I'll throw it in the clip. Is that fair? Fair? Okay. Let's throw it to the clip. You don't need to bend down. To I'm not bending. Down. What's do, your name? Do, do, I don't want to, I do not want to shake your okay. hand. <laughs> I do not want, I, I do not respect you. I don't hear that. I'm looking at the smirk in your face and I, I'm disgusted. Okay. Mm. I am off. sick. And I'm sick watching them argue with you after we've been standing outside literally for at least five to six hours between you and Holloway, between last night to now, we've been arguing with people who are not willing to be listened to for a long time. And all I see from you is arrogance and ego. I am sick looking at you. I am disgusted watching Alex argue with you. You are not listening. You are disgusting. I don't think you understand that. And before I wasn't, I, before I was not angry, per se, I was disappointed maybe. I thought maybe there was room for, for an apology. You've clearly told us that you do not plan to offer an apology for your words. You left the meeting last night to go home and then tweet, do not interrupt me, to tweet from your Twitter and then the Silliman's Twitter. You show no remorse. You tried to let your wife leave that conversation without having answered for herself. That is disgusting. That is sick. And now, I wasn't angry before. I was not angry before, but now I am actually angry, sir. I really, do not interrupt me. I was not angry. And now I want your job to be taken from you. I don't want you to have this job. I am disgusted knowing that you work at Yale University where I will get my degree, where I will look back and think I have to argue with you. All right, don't, so, I, I, no, I, I, no. I, I miss my turn now. Sir, it's my sir, now. don't do it. So, don't do it, sir. Do not do it. This is not the day. You do not want to play this game with me. Do you understand what I'm saying? You don't want to play this game with me. Okay? Understand that. Look me in my face, first of all, and understand that you are such a disappointment to this university, to your students, to yourself, to the things that you claim to agree with. You are. You want free dialogue? You want free speech? This is how it works. Someone speaks, you listen. You do not cut them off. You do not do these, these condescending gestures. You do not smirk. Yeah. You look them in the face and you wait. You wait until it is your turn. Okay, so before we even dive into that, mm -hmm. the second we played the clip, you let out a big exhale. You're yeah, just not I mean, it was, that interested in this anymore. Yeah, or, or it's depressing to look back at. Both it. are true. It's you know, it's um, I was in the courtyard for two hours and fifteen minutes, from four to six fifteen. About an hour of footage has been released of from five or six different vantage points. You showed one clip that's yeah. typically not the clip that's shown. Um, so many people put stuff online. You can re you can piece together the whole hour between five and six. For the first hour that I was out in the courtyard, I listened quietly to the students. Um, you know, there's a lot of stuff that that young woman said that's just factually wrong. Um, she's alluding to an event that occurred the night before at the Afri Afro-American Cultural House at Yale where there was a huge event with hundreds of students. Um, it had been announced at the beginning that, that we would have to leave that event at the conclusion. It was, I can't remember the precise timing, but I think it was scheduled from six to eight. My wife had to teach a class from seven to nine, so she did in the evening. So she told her students she'd be late and we'd stay from six to eight. She did, in fact, speak to the crowd. 
she um, had to leave to teach. And I, we had a student in the hospital actually that evening that I was responsible for. And that also was known. So, so when she said that we tried to leave, that's not, that's false. Um, you know, I think that um, many of the students were swept up in a kind of a mob fervor. I think they behaved badly. Um, they should have known better. I think they were trying to assert power. If I had a tool when I was that age that could get grown-ups into trouble, right? Uh, you know, probably I would just <laughs> get doing it nonstop, right. you know. And they have found a tool, and yes. they often are doing it. Nonstop. Yes, yes, and and so, but so I think what distressed me is I think at some point in the background of that footage that one of the administrators, actually the author, what happened is is a man by the name of Burgewell Howard. I had moved from North uh, Western University to Yale and had assumed a new position there. And he had written an email, he had written an, a memo while at Northwestern uh, admonishing students not to wear uh, offensive costumes. And right. I should say for the record that many of the students that, many of the costumes that he or anyone else would find offensive, I too would find offensive. Mm. Uh, I don't, wouldn't like these costumes. I, I'm well aware of the long history of racism in our society. I'm well aware of the ways in which uh, there's trafficking in certain cultural tropes that put down other groups. I reject. I am of. I have a very pro-immigrant policy. I belief system. I, I. I think that anyone can be an American. I love the idea that we have open borders. You know. I mean. I have a all set of beliefs that are around openness and welcome yeah. and so inclusion. So you're, you're a lefty. Yeah, I am quite a lefty. I am a lefty. Yeah, I'm yeah. left of center. I mean, I have some conservative ideas, some libertarian. I, I think of myself as a classical liberal, and I think of myself as very pragmatic in policy making. So I like, I like markets to address uh, most allocation of goods, but I also am very concerned about market failures, and then mm -hmm. I want government intervention. Anyway, so, um, so, uh, so that anyway, that man uh, who was a, then had moved to Yale, and then he took out of mothballs this email that he had sent at Northwestern five or ten years earlier, got a bunch of Yale administrators to sign it, and then sent it off. And in it, he had links to approved and non-approved costumes, the very costumes which were deemed to be offensive. In his email, there were links to lots mm -hmm. of those ostensibly offensive costumes. Mm -hmm. And the students, there had been a lot of conversation at the time. The New York Times had a big piece, like the previous month, about the growing use of Halloween costume advice at American colleges. So it was in the zeitgeist. This was the third, his email was the third email that had been sent out telling students, giving them advice. Mm -hmm. So in my wife's class, many of the students in the class and other students in the college where we, the sub part of Yale that we were responsible for, had told her that they felt this was very infantilizing and they didn't really need advice on what to wear. And so my wife, from a developmental perspective, wrote a response to this right. email, which itself had been, was signed by 13 administrators. It, it didn't, it was framed as guidance, but it sort of had the color of law. Mm -hmm. And um, so she wrote a response saying, and her intellectual point was not wear whatever you want. Right. Her intellectual point was, do you students at Yale in your 20s, early, late teens, early 20s, really need older adults to tell you what to wear, mm -hmm. provide you guidance. You should think about that and decide whether you really, and apparently many students did want such guidance. And so then I was, then thereafter, then all hell broke loose and I was in that courtyard and did the best I could. Yeah, what do you make of, the reason we chose that clip was because there is the other more famous clip of, of the girl mm -hmm. really berating you. There were many, many, there were dozens. Hired. I yeah. mean, that, that was the one that I think we yeah. showed here and I think that's the most viral one. But I thought that one was interesting because the angle was a little different and you could see some of the other kids yeah. and, the, and the, you know, the either tears or the look of yes. horror, all of these things, when you actually didn't do anything. Yes. Well, that's another whole topic. I think that, um, I mean, many people have analyzed those events, and honestly, I, I, don't, I don't know if I have anything to add to those analyses. I think that the, the, the thing that was very interesting to me, so, so one of the ideas that I've been thinking about for a long time is this tension between our individuality and our groupishness. Mm -hmm. And we have evolved to, first of all, it's a very interesting idea, we've evolved to be individuals, so we humans, have unique identities, so we have unique faces. So you can look at it, see a people and can tell who's who. And not only do we have the ability to signal our uniqueness, we use our faces for that, but we have the cognitive apparatus to detect that uniqueness. So you, you can have a lot of brain power you have it, that you allocate to tell who's who. 
So this ability to be individuals is crucial for our ability to function in groups. It's very paradoxical because it, you need a capacity to tell who's my offspring, who's my friend, who do I reciprocate kindness to, who do I cooperate with, who's my enemy, all of these things. So all of these capacities of individuality are crucial to our collective expression, to our ability to live together. But equally, we, um, we have this desire to surrender ourselves to the group to do something called to de-individuate, mm -hmm. to form a part of a collectivity, to suppress our individual desires, which also allows us to work together. But the irony is when you get too much of that, you get mobs, you get panics, you get you know uh, uh, all kinds of collective phenomena that are destructive rather than constructive. So when I was in the, the crowd, when I was in that mob, I, I knew what was happening, I could tell. So one of the things I started doing was, is I started asking people, What's your name? Mm -hmm. And I was trying to connect to them person to person, saying, you know, hi, I'm Nicholas. Who are you? Mm -hmm. So you're a person and I'm a person. You're not a part of this a mob. Mm -hmm. You are a human being and I'm a human being. And in fact, the, the one thing that happened that, that is, an, is an intellectual idea that's part of this book that I've been working on for 10 years, but that also I made in the heat of the moment, is in the moment I said to the students, I said that I believe in our common humanity. I believe that even though this person and this person is superficially different than me, nevertheless, we can talk to each other. We, we all have life experiences, we're human beings. And, and, it, and then if you, if you don't believe that, if you don't believe we have a common humanity, which I see as a wonderful thing. Yeah, well, that's what, that's what yes, the book is about. Yes, because yeah. I'm an optimist, for the love <laughs> yeah. of God, I'm an optimist. Yeah. If you don't believe in our common humanity, why are you even trying to talk to me? And the students jeered, Dave. Yeah. They jeered, it's on film, they jeered. And I honestly, I think that's one of the most depressing things that's happened that I've ever seen, actually, is that the Yale students in the 21st century would jeer at what I regard to be a fundamental, yeah. humane, wonderful claim about human beings, is that we have a common humanity. So, all right, so I know you don't want to spend the whole time talking I don't. about this, but, but I do, but I think a lot of this does segue to your book for mm. reasons that you just laid out. So th those- I was trying to do that. <laughs> yeah, no, very, very clever, yeah, very exactly. clever. Here's some tidbits you could yeah. Now watch what I'm gonna do. Okay, I'm gonna okay. kinda yeah. get us there, and then okay, we'll get right, right. bring us back. Um, but that look that you're talking about, when, when you say that, like we have to yeah. be able to share yeah. common humanity. I, I've been there too, I mean, yes. I face these mobs too, yes. and what I find is, there, there's an actual look they have in their yes. face where the individual that you just spoke about is gone. Yes, um, yes. Did you think there was anything, so I guess there's really, in that case, for the people that are watching this that think that one day they're gonna go against the mob, is there any other advice you would have for them on how to, how to do it? Because well, that no, doesn't I think, always work. I mean, saying, I, I've done that where I've said, I'm standing right in front of you. I'm listening to you, yes. My name's Dave, you Yes. Know? And it doesn't, it well, doesn't work Well, I think that, that um, I think that um, I I don't know I I I don't know you know there's that there's that scene in Lord of the Rings where Aragorn rushes the gates you know um, and of Mordor and I of course love those movies and uh, you know I don't know if I would have, I don't think I don't know if I would be capable of such bravery but um, Intellectually, I definitely am. That is to say, I'm not easily cowed. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I have spent my life training myself to think as clearly as I can, to look at evidence, to collect evidence. I'm a scientist, I'm an empiricist. So, um, so in, the, in the case of a mob, I don't think I would yield to a mob intellectually. Now, physically, you know, if they're, if they're throwing bricks at you, it's a different thing. Right. But I think you, you Which can- Which often that threat is always there, even if they're not holding a weapon. The threat yes. is right under It's a dangerous situation, I would agree, but mass you know, movements are always dangerous. But my point is that I think that if you, if you can keep your calm, you can think clearly about what you're saying. Also, if you've thought about these ideas before in the cool of the day, so mm -hmm. it's not the heat of the moment. So like, I've really thought about these ideas. This is not just a sudden heat of passion. Like I've, I've thought about this topic or this point, whatever it is, it doesn't have to be a political point. It can be a scientific point or something. And then when you're pressed, you know, you can say, you know, I'm listening to you. Here's what I think. Okay, what do you think? I think you can, I think you can, you can, I won't say you can win the battle of ideas, but you can at least fight it well. Yeah, what, what was the administration's response after this whole thing? 
Well, I think the administration faced a difficult challenge in deciding what to do. Many people have commented on what they did or didn't do. I'm not sure I want to go into it. Um, it took them quite a while to come to, to release any kind of public statement in support of us. Um, so, and you know, many members of the administration, junior members, were actually involved in, so in the crowd that day, there yeah, were four, four administrators, actually, uh, who, um, you know, whose others have since identified. But, um, you know, I think, I don't think it was Yale at its best, and, um, and I don't, and the students were not at their best, and, and I was not at my best. I did my best, but, you know, I think I could have done even better. So as someone that then has lived through it, where did this go wrong on college campuses? Because for the past couple of years, every time I see one of these stories, I think either, well, I used to think, oh, this, will, this is the end of it. Now people will really get it. Like I remember your, the one with you from the other video clip that we didn't show that people have seen, it was like, this is so patently absurd. Maybe this will finally be the wake up call. I've now come to believe that the wake up call isn't coming anytime soon, sadly. Um, but what, when do you think this Well, will I wrong? think this is a complicated topic. I see, you know, this is not, was not my area of expertise. I am a natural and social scientist. I run a lab with computer scientists and molecular biologists and sociologists and evolutionary biologists, and we work around the world. We do all kinds of stuff. So I, I, was, I have always been committed to liberal principles, including to free speech. When, when I was at Harvard, before I moved to Yale in 2013, uh, my wife and I came to the defense of minority students who were being um, tr having their right their speech rights squelched on campus. So it's, I, I'm committed to these ideas, but it wasn't like the most central part of mm -hmm. my life. And I'm not an expert like John Haidt or or Greg Lukianoff, mm -hmm. Lukianoff are. However, so so I see conflicting evidence. I agree with you that there are a lot of these salient cases which which they weren't before. And Jonathan feels that. They're still rising, mm -hmm. and they have their own theories, Jonathan and Greg, about yep. why. I see other evidence that looks at surveys of college students and finds that they are no more or less likely to want to suppress the speech of others than adults, than older adults. It's very tempting to silence people who you don't agree with, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, everyone wants to do that. Or I don't. I want to talk to them and persuade <laughs> them. Like, right. you know, it would, be, it would be, it's very tempting to, like, you know, shut the anti-vaxxers up, you know, prevent them from speaking. But that doesn't win, right? Mm -hmm. that, that's not a victory. What we need to do is persuade them. Why do you believe, think this? So, so if you compare college students to adults, some evidence suggests they're not more sanctimonious. Some evidence suggests there are some polls. Uh, if you look at uh, disinvitations, they're clearly rising, but they're still small. So, so the critics say there's a rising level of disinvitations, which I deplore. Mm -hmm. Let me just, can I go on a digression? Yeah, go. Yeah, so I have no, let me be very clear, because there's a lot of sloppy thinking about this. Nobody has a right to speak on a college campus. So I'm not claiming that anyone has a right. But once a group on campus right. invites you to speak, you cannot yield to the mob mm -hmm. for a disinvitation. It totally destroys the university. It's the, it's the antithesis of what a university should be like. So you can protest that person. But you cannot have disinvitations. That's just ridiculous. So, so, there, so those have been rising. But So the critics say, look, disinvitations have been rising. But the defendants say, yes, but millions of talks take place and nobody objects. Mm -hmm. So it's a tiny minority. So to answer your question, I don't, I don't think we're beyond the hump. But I'm not the expert to tell you how bad is it. D does it say something about the state of liberalism or in a way that, that this was sort of the end conclusion of liberalism, I hate to say it, that it would get sort of usurped by progressivism or whatever the new collectivist idea was. In other words, liberals are tolerant. Liberals generally are live and let live. So it was sort of fertile ground for people with bad ideas to rush in and kind of take over where perhaps conservatives are a little harder to get in at. Because yeah, they but have conservatives. They have this, yeah. yeah, but conservatives have their own political failings, right? They'll I, move I, in lockstep. No doubt. Yeah, they'll move in lockstep, so you can get them to like you know you, to to march to get to, get to uh, organize an inquisition, right? So you know it's not like right. We get conservative yeah, yeah. I'm clerics. Not, I'm not comparing either one. I'm just saying that there is there perhaps There's something, is a, a weakness of liberalism, yes. which is very sad for me to say. The openness is exactly what invites. Yeah, so this the is... The radicalism within. Yeah, so I mean, I think this is, I mean, I think, uh, you know, the open society and its, and its uh, enemies, um, you know, I think there is a sense in which you can use the, the tools to destroy the foundation. Um, 
but I also think, and this is one of the arguments that I made and I actually believe politically, which is that these very core commitments to freedom of assembly, freedom of expression, which the students were using mm -hmm. right now. They well, were also engaging in harassment, yeah. which is a different topic. And you, because I was an actor in those events, I, I, was res I didn't feel at liberty to help the students see the difference between freedom of expression and harassment, right? Yeah, somehow I don't think they would have been like, oh, let's sit down and listen to him as he explains. It explains why, yeah. you know, so you can, so the classic example is the, you know, is that, you know, you can, you can march through the streets of Skokie, Illinois, but you can't stop in front of my house, right? right? Because you know that is a threat. Mm -hmm. uh, the political expression in a public place is not. So, so, uh, so the students. So, the, so uh, um, I lost my train of thought. Where was I going? Uh, well, basically, the idea that the oh, liberalism and that yeah. yeah so, so, the, so, the, so, so these are core. The sort of non-corrupt judiciary, sort of impartial separation of powers, freedom of assembly, freedom of speech. I regard these as like foundational principles of our democracy, which are essential. L liberal principles. Liberal principles, yes. Yes. yes, yes, liberal principles, which the <laughs> students in some ways were using, right? Um, except to call for people to be fired uh, for expressing their ideas on a college campus is using these principles, but to illiberal ends. And this right. is what you're asking, I think, which is what you're saying is, can these tools be used to like degrade the, and, and the answer is yes, there is a kind of threat from within, but I still wouldn't abandon the principles. And I don't want to abandon the principles yes. either. Okay, there we go.